Before we go much further in this course, there are several things we should define so we all know what we're talking about. The first is the word statistics itself. This comes from the Latin and means state affairs, as in counting the number of people in a region for tax purposes. Also, you should note that this word can be both a plural noun and a singular noun. As a plural noun is spelled with a small s and it refers to statistical data or analyses, such as a collection of baseball statistics. On the other hand, when it's spelled with a big S, then it's a singular noun and refers to the academic and professional field of statistics. The next important term is data. It comes from the Latin datum, which means given. Technically, in Latin, datum is a singular noun and the plural version is data. Data can be used as a plural noun in English, and I'll often say things like the data are all entered, but as many people have argued that data is a mass noun as opposed to a count noun, and so it's appropriate to use it in the singular. Really, you're fine either way. Also, there's the small issue of pronunciation. It depends in part on whether you're speaking American or British English, but it's perfectly acceptable to use data, which is the American version that I usually use, or data, which is the British version. People will know what you're talking about in either case. Next is the term population. This refers to an exhaustive group of all of the people or cases in a category that you're interested in. It's the group that you want to talk about even if you can't get data from all of them. In statistics, however, it's often the case that when we talk about a population, what we're actually talking about is a mathematical abstraction that's defined by a formula. This is certainly the case when we get to inferential statistics later in the course. One important thing to know about populations, however, is that it's customary to represent population parameters or information about the population with Greek letters, like mu for the population mean or beta for a population regression coefficient. The complement to a population is a sample, which is the portion of the population that you actually have data from. Ideally, the sample will accurately represent the population that it came from, or you can run into serious problems. That, however, is a methodological issue and not a statistical issue per se. As I mentioned just a moment ago, information about a population is referred to as a parameter and uses Greek letters for symbols. In contrast to that, information about a sample is called a statistic and is usually written with Latin letters, which are the regular letters that we use in the English alphabet. The next term is descriptive statistics. This refers to a broad class of procedures, all of which exist, to describe the data that you have actually observed and that are right in front of you. These are sometimes called summary statistics or maybe even exploratory statistics, although both of these properly refer to a subset of descriptive statistics. The final term for right now is inferential statistics, which is another broad class of procedures and the part that most people associate with statistical analysis. These are the procedures that use data from a sample to try to describe the larger population the sample came from, even when you don't have data from all of the population. That is, you use the sample data to infer things about the populations. Also, if you want to infer things correctly, you'll need to have a sample that accurately represents the population that it came from. But, as mentioned before, that's more of an issue for research methods than for data analysis itself. The next few terms concern the purposes of data analysis. It can be helpful to think of analysis as serving a few general goals, the first of which is univariate descriptions. These are individual facts about a particular group of people, such as seven of the nine Supreme Court justices ruled in favor of the plaintiff, or Mrs. Fyodor Vasilyev, a Russian peasant, gave birth to 69 children between 1725 and 1765, which is apparently true. Now, let's explain what we mean by the term univariate statistics. In full, these procedures can be called univariate descriptive sample statistics. Each part of this name means something. They're called univariate because they present one variable at a time, as opposed to two or more. They're descriptive because they describe, as opposed to infer, which will be mentioned in a moment. The word sample, as opposed to population, is in there because these data describe the data from an observed or measured group of people. And as we've mentioned before, statistics is the term for information about a sample.
It's also possible to describe an entire population where one's not actually gathered information from every single person, such as 56% of voters are in favor of the proposed amendment, plus or minus 3%. This is an example of inferential statistics, and it's the plus or minus part that makes it descriptive of a group of people that's only partially known. We'll have much more to say about this later. So descriptive statistics can be thought of as the first goal of data analysis, and the second goal is associations. Instead of describing one variable at a time, it's possible to describe the associations between two or more variables simultaneously, such as women as a group have an average higher score on standardized tests of verbal fluency than men do, or people who score higher on certain video games also tend to score higher on some common intelligence tests. As with univariate description, associations can be described for both samples and populations. There is, however, at least one important thing to keep in mind, and that is that the nature of the association between two variables, that is, the reason why there is an association between them, can be unclear. Two very general possibilities are that the association may be causal, which means that changes in one variable directly produce changes in the other variable. And please don't confuse this word with casual, which is an entirely different thing. Or the association may be spurious, which means that it's accidental and meaningless. That is, while the two variables may show an association, it's not the case that one produces the changes in the other. It may be coincidental, or changes in both may be produced by some other thing. A trivial example of this is the association between, say, attendance at baseball games and the number of action movies released in a month. It's not that baseball makes people want to see superheroes or vice versa. It's just that both happen during the summer. They both go up during the summer and down during the winter. So there'll be an association even though it's not a meaningful one. Spurious correlations can happen in other more important domains, though, so it's important to always consider the possibility that an observed association might not be what it seems. And that actually gets us to the third general purpose of data analysis, as far as this course goes, and that's causality. Causality refers to the determination that one thing causes another. And while there are many epistemological models for causality, one simple one focuses on three aspects. The first is a statistical association or correlation. That is, when a cause occurs, the effect should also occur, or at least be more likely. If the putative effect has only a random association with the supposed cause, then it would be silly to label it cause and effect. The second aspect is temporal precedence. That is, causes need to come before effects. That shouldn't be too surprising, although you can get more complicated situations of reciprocal causation, that is, where each variable has a causal effect on the other, as with a feedback loop or with the metaphorical vicious circle. And finally, there should be no alternative explanations for the association between the variables. This is the difficult one. In fact, it's fundamentally impossible, although one can get close enough for practical purposes. But here's the mantra that all researchers must learn. Correlation does not imply causation, at least not by itself. In fact, if you want to get a good understanding of causality, there are generally a few things you can do, and that's what I want to mention next. In the research world, if you really need to know what causes what, then the most common approach is to conduct a randomized experiment. What this means is a controlled situation with, first, standardized conditions. So you make as many things similar as possible for all of your participants, so there are very few possible alternative explanations available. Second, you need experimental manipulation of conditions. That is, you need to be the one who creates the differences between the groups of people, such as giving patients one kind of medicine or another, or giving groups of students one kind of curriculum or another. Most often, the participants are randomly assigned to conditions. This is important because the process of randomization creates something called probabilistic equivalence, which means that different groups are likely to be similar as a whole on nearly any variable that you measure, assuming that your groups are large enough. In an experimental context, it's common to call the manipulated variable, that is, the one you control, like the medicine or curriculum assigned, the independent variable, or IV. It's independent because it doesn't depend on anything else in the study. 
And the measured outcome variable, or the thing that should be affected by the manipulation, such as the wellness of a patient or the learning of students, is called the dependent variable, or DV. That's because the scores on this depend in part on the condition that you assign people to in the independent variable. So a randomized experiment is generally considered the best way to determine if one variable truly causes changes in another, but it's not the only way. It's also possible to use quasi-experiments, which means like an experiment, to investigate cause and effect relationships. This is an entire class of research designs that are more common in some fields, such as education or economics, and in others, such as medicine or psychology. But the general idea is this. First, observational data, or data from non-randomly assigned groups, is gathered, or may already exist from archival records. And then, methodological and or statistical controls to adjust for bias in estimating causal effects. Quasi-experiments can be difficult to do well, but they can also be used in a huge variety of circumstances where standard experimental methods would be difficult, unethical, or impossible to do. I'm not going to say more about these methods in this course, but I think that any researcher who wants to use data to understand not just univariate distributions and bivariate associations, but also cause and effect relationships, owes it to themselves to look into these methods carefully.